Thank you. 
And today's word comes from Mark chapter 12, verse 33. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything that she had to live on. Lord, we thank you for this verse that it's not only about money, it's also about the time we put in, it's about our talents, it's about our gift, it's about our heart. How much do we invest in the kingdom of God? Help us to learn from that, Lord. That's not just about putting a check. It's more than that, Lord. It's about the love that we have for you. Let us learn that love. Let us continue just to praise you, Lord. Be with those that are on their way here, Lord. But again, let us just uh, open our hearts and praise you. In Jesus' name.
Good morning, everyone. Yes, it is nice. Just a couple quick things. Um, we'll talk about more next week. There is going to be a very, very, very short devotion at the August 6th thing. Uh, we're going to do it right at the beginning. Uh, it's not the best timing, but we'll talk about next week how we do it. But we're going to congregate everybody. There's going to be a very, like I said, five, ten minutes. And there'll be an invitation as well. I don't know if there'll be 20 adults there or 20 kids, but we are going to continue to preach the word here. And I hope that that little message will, will touch. If it touches one soul, is it worth doing it? And then we're going to turn them loose and have a lot of food, fun, and all that. So there will be a short devotion. I tell you that as you invite neighbors, as you invite people that you know who may have kids or grandkids who don't. And it's not just about the kids, but people who don't know the gospel. Um, we're going to always make that available here. So, again, looking forward to that. Um, uh, you'll notice in the back, next to the offering, we've got that little uh, bowl there, again, for Vanessa, Whitney's uh, sister-in-law. We're just going to give a little gift card uh, for the baby Ezra. They can get some gifts and that. So, as we talk about giving today through the widow, uh, whatever you want to put a dollar, however that is, um, maybe you don't have a dollar and you want to pray for that. Just appreciate doing that. Next week we're going to begin the gospel of Luke. We're truly just running right through the gospel. So we'll begin Luke next week. Um, also, next week I want to take 10 minutes at the beginning and I want to share with you very briefly what God has laid on my heart for the coming year or so at this church. Not about what we've done, but it's not, it's not my plan. It's his plan. It involves getting involved in some things and prayer and prayer groups and and other things. And I'll just take about 10 minutes and do that. We'll talk more about it later. But I'm also going to allow a, minute, a few minutes if you want to respond to that. It's not about whether you like me or don't like me or didn't, that we're not going to. The purpose of you sharing is where I feel the heart needs to go. Or I think there's this ministry, we should open up a ministry for that. I want to know what your hearts think. And if nobody shares, that's fine. But I do want to give you a minute or two, okay? But the focus is where God is taking us in the future, not where we we've been. So anyway, finally, um, I asked you last week as you left to chew on your cut a little bit, okay? And, you know, I said it a little, you know, and I won't mention who it is because I want to say, but one of you came up to me and threw it back in my face, okay? And I'm glad, and it doesn't sound, but it was basically, you know, Pastor, you preached last week that God's salvation is 100%, and the question was, where this per and he's not here today, so I guess I'll answer it next week because I want him to be. It's a teachable moment, not just for one. It's a teachable moment for everyone. So I want to have him here, but he's basically saying, I believe that the prayer I pray to accept salvation is a part of Jesus' 100% package. So in other words, I played a role. That, that's where the person is at. And I want to answer that question in 10 or 15 minutes because it is a teachable moment for all of us. So again, I was going to do it today. I've already saved you 10 or 15 minutes from today's sermon, so that's good as you're thinking I can get out here a little early. But anyway, and I want to share that with you. If there's any biblical things that are on your heart, I'd love maybe once a month to take 15 minutes of a sermon and teach on that biblical thing. But it's not a disagreement with you, Pat. It's just that I'm struggling with that, or I'm struggling with that. It's got to be a biblical. I want to know what you thought. I was not offended when he said, hey, pastor, I want you to chew on your cud for a week. He's still struggling. That I don't believe it's all God. So anyway, I want to encourage you to share that with me, okay? But so, we're, so we're not talking opinions. We're not discussing politics. We're actually biblical, good biblical thoughts. So you pray about that, all right? Okay, we're actually going to finish up Mark today. I'm going to talk on three simple issues. I'm going to talk on, well, not simple. I'm going to talk on money a little bit. I'm going to talk on marriage today. And I'm going to talk on divorce because they're in those th they're in these passages. You know, over the years, friends, maybe you, I've been asked all these questions. This, that, this, that. Am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? And I just want to touch on a couple things. We're going to pick up on... Let's see, Mark 12. We'll be in Mark 12, verse 41. As I said in the opening thing, the widow's offering. Again, Mark 12, 41. Jesus sat opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, 
worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of their poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. So get the picture again, set the scene. Jesus is in the courts. He's actually in what they call the court of the women. And he's standing against the wall as though I'm looking at that wall back there. And there's 13 receptacle plates back there. And what that is, that is the offering when people come in, coins that uh, they wouldn't do checks back then. They put their coins in. they got to remember, it's the Passover week too. Jesus is watching everybody. It would be no different if I sat here for the last hour and watched you come in and put your, your check or your thing in the little box there. Jesus is sitting here watching all of this. And we see a contrast. People coming in, putting in their amounts. And as he talks about, people of wealth putting in large amounts. He sees that. And then all of a sudden, on the other side of the spectrum, this poor little old widow comes in and puts in her offering. Mark tells us it's only a couple coins. What it actually was, we it was two copper, you know, it's almost, let's relate to today's currency. It would, the smallest coin back then was copper. It'd be like she, her putting in two pennies, because the pennies are smallest currency. She doesn't come in and put a big, she doesn't come in and put gold, yeah, gold and bronze and silver were all different kinds of coins, no different than we have in our currency. And she comes in and she puts in these two copper coins. Now, everybody wants to know, what's the amount of that? You know, actually, it was, I don't want to get mathematical here, but it's 1 64th of a denarius, which was a day's work. Now, how, what would that be today? Now, again, let's, in the bottom line of it all, she's putting in two small coins. Basically, she's putting in what we would say is a couple cents. Because when you do the math, it'd be like four to six cents today, but back then, it's like her putting in two pennies. And Jesus wants to make this a teaching moment, as I do today. I want to make it a teaching moment. And as I, as I prayed about this a few minutes ago, it's not all about the money. It might be your gifts, your talents, the time you invest in this church, the time you invest in other people, the things you do. So it's not just about all money. Jesus wants to teach his disciples something. To say, it's not, it's not just the quantity. God doesn't need the money anyway, but the temple did. It's not the quantity. It's the quality of the heart. And she had given everything. I've heard this preach, and this is not the preach. This is not the sermon today. Folks, I want you to get your bank wallets. And I want you to get your IRAs. And I want you to put it all back there. Yet we see that. We see that sadly on television times. That's sad. That's not the message here. Jesus is not criticizing the other half. He's focusing on that lady who came in here. Because we think, well, wait a second, Lord, you're telling me that if I'm not like the little old lady giving it all, then you don't love me. That's not the message of there. And I'm not going to ask you to do that. Yeah, and if you got money set aside for the grandkids' college, forget it. Put it all in the coin box. Jesus isn't going there. God can use that money however he wants, whether you... You know, there's sermons on tithing 10%, whether you give more or less. Again, I'd rather have it, you give your money, you give your time, you give your talents, you give your heart. You may not help out on August 6th, but you might invite three grandkids who live two doors down from you, knowing that they're not only going to have a great meal, but a little fun, but they might understand even Jesus' first name. I mean, that's how you gave your time to knock on a door or whatever. God looks at all that. But let's look at this woman. We're not, this is not a critical thing against the other. This woman only had those two coins. Wow. Those two coins to buy like 
in Elijah, she only had a little oil and flour and then she was going to die. That's all. She, she did not know what tomorrow would bring. Wow. This lady really is poor. Yeah. And she gave it not with a bad attitude. Well, I gave a lot to Jesus, but I, you know, I, I'm really struggling. That's a, that's a whiny, negative attitude. Jesus sees the heart here. And he saw that, how did she give it? Not whining and coming. She gave it with love. So I don't want to talk about your tithing habits today. But as God has blessed me over time, my tithings have gotten better. I don't mention a monster. That's between God and I. But do you give with the heart? Not rather, I'm going to empty it all out today. Total checkbook. I'll even get in the art. I'm going to give it to God. But even the way I say that has a bad attitude. Again, what you give to God of your heart, if you give you, it's, that's what's important. Think about that as we go into the next year or so. And I'm not saying people haven't given of their heart and their time and their love. That is so important. It was quite a message to the disciples. I hope it touched you in a special way. How am I giving? Not just money. But I have many people come up and say, you're telling me to give it all. I don't... No, that's not the... Remember the lady, she gave it all. That's money. Let's talk a little about marriage. Mark talks about it. And I want to talk a little bit about, about it too. You know, someday it's not going to happen. Someday I'd like to know your thoughts on that. I don't know if we'll do an hour seminar. I don't know if we'll do it, But I'd like to know your thoughts on that. With all that's going on today, I'm not going to preach about it today, but I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Not that we all have to be on the same page, but there's a lot going on in marriage. I want to talk briefly about what was God's plan for marriage? And how is that being lived out in the world today? Well, just think about that. Let Chew on that for a little while. Maybe we'll talk about it another time. I mean, again, I'm in Mark 12, verse 18 to 27. Let's set the scene again. Mark 12, 18. Then the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, they didn't believe in the resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, a man must carry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Question mark. Jesus answered him. Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? They had erred two ways. We'll talk about that. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. You are badly Mistake. And again, the Sadducees, as Jesus is approaching his way to Jerusalem, the, cross, the Sadducees want to trip him up. The Pharisees will do it. We want to trick him. We want to discredit We want him to say something that's so questionable to the word of God that people will react to him in a negative way. So they bring up this question of not so much marriage, but the deeper issue is the resurrection. It's funny we talked about that in, in, the, in the Sunday school today. Now, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in future judgment of God. They didn't believe in angels and spirits. And like the oral traditions of the Pharisees, remember the Pharisees took all the law, but they added two or three hundred of their oaths, oral traditions. They didn't believe in that other. So that's just a little bit about the Sanhedrin, despite, despite the fact that they were rulers in a way. They only believed in the five books of Moses, Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, called the Pentateuch. And they're talking about, and I won't get into they're talking about Deuteronomy 25. What happens when a husband and wife are married and the husband dies? 
what happens to the woman, what happens to the generation, does the family continue? And to keep it simple, that if there was a brother or a close relative, they would marry that widow to preserve the family. It's a good thing. Now, there were seven brothers. That's a made-up story. That wasn't really a story. The, the, you got to remember, the Sadducees are approaching Jesus with a nasty heart. And Jesus knows that. Notice that he doesn't react violently. He doesn't punch anybody. He, he's, he's wise to what they're trying. You know, sometimes we need to be wise. You know, i got to be honest. When you were all walking out last week, and my brother, who isn't here today, and, and I, I won't tell who it is, actually, but when he walked out and says, Pastor, I want you to chew on your cud for a week. If that had been me 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have been surprised at my attitude. I would have taken that very personally. I wouldn't have done that. I, would have, I don't think I'd beat him up anyway. He'd probably kill me. <clears throat> but anyway, I would have taken it quite differently. Like, wow, I'm, a, I'm offended by that. But again, I hope that as you look back, God is maturing you in some way. And I thought, I'm going to dig into the word. on it. It's a great issue. And like I said, anytime any of you bring something up, I want it. Because if it's teachable for, for Jim, it's teachable for Bobby. It's teachable for, it's teachable for all of it. And I dug in. And I chewed on it all week. And I chewed on it. And I went back to the scriptures and chewed on it. You know? And I grow. That's why I ask you to do that. If there's things you do, go back to the word of God. Go back to prayer. Go back. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And I was but did it change my thinking of God giving? No, it didn't change. It blessed it. So in a way, I, I applaud my brother for challenging me in a good way. So here's the Sadducees trying to trick Jesus with a story they don't believe. And Jesus says, verse 24, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or you do not know the power of God? Jesus is going to approach this from two angles. My friends, he didn't say my friends, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. You know, today in the Sunday school, we talked about the power of God, the living power of the resurrected life. We really didn't get into that, but if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, are you living the resurrected life now? It, it's a yes or no question. If you are, doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect walk. Do you believe that? They didn't believe that. And he says, by the way, you don't know the scriptures. You know, I've told that to people here. I don't think I said, not here. I said, you don't know the scriptures. And you know, that's kind of a tough thing to say to somebody. But there are times when people, they don't know. They don't know what's here. And Jesus kind of walks them through that. He starts with the second one. In verse... Let's see, verse 25. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. I'm sure this has been preached to you. Are we going to have the wife and spouse we have in, hev in life now? Are they going to be with us in heaven? They'll be with us, as will all children of God. But will we be married, husband and wife, like we are on the earth? Jesus gives us that answer. No. We're going to be like angels. Be careful. I didn't say angels. You will not be, you will be like an angel. Immortal, eternal. You know, you sit and think, David, I can't, Pastor, I can't wrap my arms around the love that's going to be there. Yes, don't try to wrap your arms around, because you can. It's going to be so wonderful. But we will be like angels. You know, I look at Bill and Sue. Yeah, you know, I could, and I could mention a couple here, okay? I mean, that love from earthly love will be so wonderful and heavenly love. You know, we think of marriage. We think of romance and we think of sexuality. And we think of procreating and all that. And that's going to happen. That's not going to... There won't be any of some of those latter things. There will be not procreation in heaven. We won't be making babies in heaven. All those children will already be there. So marriage... It's not to be looked at what happened, you know. And I, I don't, have you ever talked to people about this? I mean, I do talk about that. Yeah, when I get to heaven, I'll have my condo on the lake with the boat, okay? And I'm going to have a pond, And my husband and wife will be there. My six kids. I'm going like, you will be with them together in God's unity, but it won't be set up like a worldly thing. I hope that's not negative to anybody. It's just the love will be so grand. We can't, 
we can't imagine how wonderful it's going to be. Angels don't have marital relations. Angels don't procreate is what Jesus... We're going to be like the angels. Doing what? In love and fellowship of God, praising Him and whatever God's plan is. I trust in that. I hope you do too. Again, it's all centered on God, not what happens in life will happen in heaven. No, it's going to be completely different. So he answers that. Then he goes back to, so he's telling them, well, you don't believe in the power of God here. And you don't believe the scriptures. So he, he, answered, he, answered, he answered one of the questions, the errors they had. You think, you think marriage today back then it's going to be like marriage in heaven. Nope. Now he talks to him. You don't know the scriptures. Verses 26 and 27. Now about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. The, the Sadducees are saying, Jesus there's no mention of the five books of anything in the resurrection. I don't know if I would have found it, but Jesus point. Yes, there's talk of the resurrection in the five books of Moses. And you're thinking, where? Jesus gave them the example of the burning bush. And the power of that is I am, not I was. If he said, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's saying, he'd be saying, was is past they're dead. But he isn't. He's saying, I am the God. What is Jesus saying? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are in heaven with God the Father right now. They are living. They have been, in a way, resurrected spiritually right now. Eventually, their body will be resurrected. But they are of the living. God is of the living. So as they said, I don't believe in resurrection. Jesus just said, yeah, there's one point. There is a resurrection. It happened to the three patriarchs. It'll happen to us as well. So Jesus has taken them on in both issues. About not understanding the power of God and not understanding Scripture. There will be a resurrection. You know, they're already... Let me correct it. There, yeah, let me add to that. There, there already has been a resurrection. We had the resurrection... Of Lazarus we talked today. We had the resurrect the true resurrection of Jesus, the first fruits. There will be a resurrection when we take our last breath, the Spirit going to heaven. There will be a resurrection of the body when Jesus is ready. There will be a resurrection of the old saints, the old testament saints, at the end of time. And yes, there will even be a resurrection of those who are in Hades. Right now, God has them. They're not in hell. And God will judge them in the great throne judgment. I don't want to talk about that, but all these resurrections have, they are occurring, and they will happen. The question for us is, do you feel that you're living that resurrected life now? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking, often when I say these things, it's not referred to you, maybe except to challenge you. I see so many people, they're just not living the resurrected life. And I'm not saying they're not good or bad. I'm not saying they're going to heaven. I'm just saying they're not living the resurrected life. And that's a challenge to me to live it as well. Even when I have tough moments. Are you living that resurrected life? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection? And I hope you do. So there was a resurrection. There will be a resurrection. There will be a body resurrection. There will be all of those resurrections. And he corrects. He corrects the Sadducees here. So we've talked a little bit about money today. We've talked a little about marriage today. What it will be like. You know, when I say it's going to be wonderful, I think, I've got to be careful saying that because I don't want to label it. But how do, I, how do I deal with it? It's going to be more fantastic than I can even imagine. And it's, an about, it's not about me or you or what we get. It's about how good our Lord is. And will there be wow moments? Let them happen when they happen. But never forsake that those wow moments happen in this life too. Not all of it, not everything, but a lot of those wow moments. 
We should really wake up every day, and I, I wish I would do it every day. We should wake up every day and have a wow moment. Maybe it's the sun. Maybe you say, I have another breath. Maybe the heart is beating better. Maybe the doctor took care of me. But we should have a wow moment and praise God for that. So, so we talked a little about marriage. We talked a little about money. One more issue. And as you can probably tell, I'm going to keep it short today. I want to talk very briefly on divorce. It's in the scripture. And if you wonder, why do I talk about the three or four things? God lays this on my heart. I don't pick it out. I think I'll talk about it. I talk about the things God has laid in my heart as I go through the week and put it together. If God wants to change my mind, he's going to change my mind. But, you know, this may not be relevant to you, but I've talked to so many people in my ministry, God's ministry, at Billy Graham or as a pastor, and I hear this a lot. Maybe you'll hear this, and maybe that's why I should share it with you. Oh, I've been divorced. I'm going to hell. And that's the answer. Maybe you've never said that. Maybe you've never heard that. But I have many, many a times. And they read a verse. Malachi 2.16. God hates divorce. So obviously if that's going, he hates me. And I said, stop, 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 stop. Be careful about reading one line. Know the context. The paragraph. Read the chapter. Read the, the whole book. Read the whole book. What is God saying about divorce. Now the interesting thing, he's sharing this in chapter 10, and I just want to read this. This happened right before the rich young ruler last week, so he's still in Perea. Uh, Mark 10, chapter 1. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. It's called Perea. Again, crowds of people came to him, as was his custom. He taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him. Ah, see the testing again. By asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Remember Joseph was thinking of doing that with Mary right after, during the betrothal before the marriage. Not to hurt her, not to stone her, but to send her away. Just That came to my heart. Verse 5, it was because your hearts were hard. That Moses wrote you that law. Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Again, I'm going to keep this very short. It's a tough subject for many. I've known people who have gone through that two or three times. And yet, I always want to be merciful. I always want to be graceful, as I hope God, God is to them. But the Pharisees are testing him. And if you study Deuteronomy 24, we won't get into it. Jesus tells us that right here. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you that law. That law that you can permit someone to divorce and we don't have to stone it and they can move forward, that was written because of man's heartlessness towards people and divorce. So God in his grace and mercy allows for that. I don't want to compare that today, but God allows for that today. That grace and mercy. Maybe because of adultery, maybe because of wrongful relationships, maybe because of abuse. God allows for that in a court of law. And that is very, that is very important. He talks a little bit about marriage here. What is God's, and again, we're not going to spend too much time on it. You know that this is severely under attack, but... It shouldn't be in the church world. What is God's view of marriage? He goes back to the creation. One man, one woman. Becoming one flesh. Most of you had these verses read to you when you were married. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. The two of you will become one flesh. 
You're probably still thinking about that. Chew on it a little, okay? Two into one. Yeah. Not two, but two into one. Hopefully with, with God. I don't know about you, but I find a lot of people, man and woman, come together, and there's no God. Uh-uh. You need the two together with God. That's what marriage is. Should it be monogamous? Yep. Should it be heterosexual? Yep. Should it be permanent in this life? Yeah. God wants that. Should it be one flesh? Yeah. Well, pastor, you're spewing hate out here. No, no. I'm, pre I'm believing God's word. I believe that. I believe that everybody can be loved. Everybody should be loved. No one should be discriminated. But this is, this is God's law. Rather than, you know, I have my own opinions on this. We're not going to do that. We're going to preach the word of God. Doesn't mean I'm right or better than anybody because I walk that way. I don't want to get in a prideful thing. But God does say that I hate divorce. He doesn't want it. Thank God for his forgiveness and I always I always have to share this as a pastor would it's not just going through the civil requirements of a paper of a judgment of being granted that divorce there's something very very deeper than that it's moving on and forgiving wow not that you had to agree with what happened in the past, but you, you forgave it. And I've, asked, I've often interviewed people for positions, and I said, can I ask you a question? While God granted you that divorce, do you forgive that person who harmed you? I've had a lot of answers, friends. Yeah, I've truly forgiven them for some of the ungodly or the adult, whatever would have happened. I could go on... Well, and I've heard, no, I'm never gonna, gonna, I'm never ever gonna forgive that person, that husband or that wife. You know what I mean? You can imagine what they say. And I don't know about you, but I think, you know, I can understand the shoes you're in, but wow, God wants you to forgive that. And I know there's no two situations the same. So while God does grant that through His mercy and grace, we still need to forgive. Instead of carrying the anger. Maybe you don't do it, but I hope you've seen people who still carry that anger in their heart. They still carry that hate. So we've talked a little about money today. It's, it's not about money, but your talents, your gifts, your time. And I truly hope everybody... Gets involved in the August 6th thing. Whether one kid comes or 40 kids come and 20, I truly believe that. Everybody has a hand in it. Maybe you just want to pray for somebody. That's fine. We've talked in both last two sections on what God, what is God's plan for marriage. If you're living that out, that's, in, that's an indirect praise to our God. Thank you, God. Thank you that you, you took the vows. Nobody's perfect. Marriages come up and down. And you live those vows. And if you've lost a spouse, as I have, you carried that out to the end. Despite the ups and the downs and the pains and the, the medical situations. Stay true to that. God will bless that. You may not always see it. People watch that. People watch how you take care of your spouse. They see that in great ways. And that's a great sign because I do think the world is watching us, how we respond to that. Privately, I'd like to know your thoughts on other things that, that I'm not going to talk about today. Are we still here to love people? Yeah. But I'm going to live the life that God has laid on my heart. Um, I still think it's God's plan. But we've got to be careful not to say, I'm better than you are. And finally, thank God for God's love, knowing man's heart. I'm going to show some mercy and grace. I want to close here, uh, keeping this a little short, and just briefly touch on what I want to share. Maybe I'll share it next week, about five or ten minutes. 
but it, 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 it deals with it deals with the question that was thrown at me. And maybe I'll I think I'll do that. I think I'll start it and stop. And we'll pick it up next week. I think that's a good one. That's what the Holy Spirit's telling me. Pastor's preaching that you can't do anything to get your salvation. 100%. And the question is, I kind of disagree with that. I think my prayer to receive Jesus is part of that. You got, you got the question where the division is? Pastor's saying it's all of God over here. And this part, no, I had a hand in that. Kind of like the rich young ruler. So I'm going to start by drawing a huge line right up. There's a huge line here. Huge line. See it. To this side, it's all of God. Everything I'm going to preach today is all over here. He did it. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did it. What's on this side, Pastor? This is where you first make that prayer and you start to live that eternal life. Because, and I'll paraphrase, we weren't there at the beginning of time when God knew us. And he did know us. And he did predestine. And he did choose us. And he loved and he adopted. And if, he, and if you don't want to, I accept that. God adopted me before the son was created. I can't, I can't prove that, but I know that because the word of God tells me. He predestined me to do good works, not, not salvation. He chose me as he chose you. Okay, that was before I wasn't even born. He stands on the cross of Calvary ready to be crucified for my sin. And he looked to the Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He wasn't just talking to the Jews, he was talking to all... Forgive and the Father forgave us. The Father, I'll keep it simple. The Father forgave me. Do you say the Father forgave you? I hope you do because He did. The Father and Jesus agreed, and that sin was judged on the cross. My sin was my sin past was judged on that cross. Wow, He did that before I was born. So don't start thinking I have a huge role in this, and I do have a plan in my in the future, but I'm not even born yet. It's all over here. God the Father resurrected him before I was born. Okay. And let's not forget on Good Friday, Jesus prayed for me in Gethsemane. Now, he doesn't have a list of a million, eight billion people. He prayed for you in Gethsemane. You know, the question is, do you believe that or not? I believe he prayed for us in John. He prayed for himself, he prayed for the disciples, and he prayed for the believers. I wasn't born yet. Now again, please, he didn't have a huge David, Bill, Jenny, Karen, he did, but he prayed for the believers. I mean, why would you do that, Jesus? I thought, wow, that's a wow moment. Why would you? You loved me that much. And then the Father resurrected you. All this happened before I was even born. And I'm going to say, my prayer was a part of the salvation. No, the salvation was done when Jesus died and the Father resurrected. Salvation was done. Let's remember one thing. The little box I was going to put. Salvation's not a thing. Salvation's not an it. It's a person. The Jesus, the Father, Son, live inside. That's what the salvation gift is. We get all the, I'm being saved and I'm being reborn almost like it's a thing. And it is a, it is a one. But never forget that it's the person that lives inside of you that makes all the difference. And I'm saying this to somebody on his line, uh, who's watching online, that as we ask and we close the service, if you don't know Jesus, you're not praying to get a thing. You're not praying to get an... You're praying to have Jesus actually come and live inside of you. You know, at the August 6th, if I say a timid devotion, and one kid accepts Jesus Christ, and he's at a mature age, I believe that Jesus came into that... Despite the fact he'll probably struggle over the next 80, 90 years of his life believe that. So all that happened before that. And like the rich young ruler, yeah, but I had a hand in it. No, you didn't. You know, let's think of some things that man has done to try to add to God. God built a paradise and Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They kind of blew it. God makes this beautiful paradise and creation and man had to build a tower of Babel. Okay? God gives the Pharisees the word of God and they have to add two or three hundred words of 
for. Can't you see that so much of what we want to do, we mean well, but it, we're not God. Okay, so where are you going this past? All of this has already happened before time is why I believe that salvation is all of God. Then where does the prayer fit in? It doesn't fit in on the, it fits in on this side. That the first thing you ever done, the first act that you ever made, and this is true of all of us if we know Jesus, the first act as we went through the cross was to pray that prayer. That was the first thing you did. We think that I've added to God. I don't want to even get on that thing where I have to add to God. God is good and God is great and God is and he doesn't need me. So that first prayer, that beautiful prayer you said. And somebody out there, if you want to pray to accept Jesus today, all you have to do is ask him in your heart. Tell him you're a sinner. That you believe he died. And maybe you don't understand that. You, he died, but the Father raised him. And you want him in your life. You've tried everything. We truly believe the word says he comes into your heart. Whether you're five and you're mature or you're 105. God tells us in Philippians 2.12. I want to read it word for word and I'll close. And by the way, I thank my brother for saying, chew on the cud, pastor. I did. I dug into it. What did I say? Ephesians? Yeah. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Philippians. Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Work out your salvation. That does not mean you get 10%, 10%. It means you already have it. Now begin working that salvation. Each and every one of you, if you're a child of God, you're still working on your salvation. You have it. But you're working out step by step by step by step by step. And you're doing things now that you wouldn't have done five to. You're working that salvation out. Someone said, well, you, are you telling me that as I do each thing, I gain salvation? No, you already have it. It's a gift. Because who, why do you have it? Because it's a person that lives in you. Jesus doesn't give you 10% of himself. He gives you all of himself. You know, I don't know about you, but when I say that, I get joyous. I get excited. I'm, not, I'm never going to apologize for my, my enthusiasm. I get excited. I hope that you do that when you're with Lord maybe in your private times or we need to praise him but that first step in working out your salvation is that prayer and somebody online or here may say that prayer in a few minutes or in a local church and the heavens will rejoice and the angels will rejoice you don't only see it in the church body but they will that was a little bit of the story that was told to me and again I always encourage you if you have anything on your heart to share it with me if it's biblical and it's teachable, it's worth teaching here in a sermon. I believe that. Because I think everybody can learn a bit. You may still disagree with me on that, and that's okay. I'm still going to love you. I disagree with you. Because it's all of God. The scriptures have, have shared that. But that first step. Remember when, your baby, remember when your first child took that first step? They did that first step. That's what it's like. And you all did something different. I don't know if it was at a revival or a meeting or maybe it was private. Someone could have been in a bar. You know, Billy Graham used to preach. You could be in a bar having your 15th drink and you've just had it. And you give your life. It's different. But we all come the same way. We come through the death of Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you for this time as short as it is today. That it's all about you. How loving you are, how gracious you are, how merciful you are. I can't take it all in at times. But Lord, thank you that when we ever ask for that, it's there. There might be someone here praying for something really serious in their life today. Or a person, Lord. Let them ask of that. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that I've, as I've kind of laid an altar call here to anybody listening. Believe that God did it all and did it fantastic. You tell us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We believe that verse 100%.
God wouldn't lie. He will accept you as a child and adopt you and predestine you. Thank you, Lord, if there's anybody lifting up a prayer of forgiveness today, Lord. But, Father, thank you for teaching us. Maybe we've heard it said many times before, but it's not the amount you give. It's your heart. Father, thank you for those who are walking that walk in marriage. And for some of us who continue to walk that walk with you after that marriage ends. Knowing that we'll still see our loved one one day. Father, always thank you for your mercy. I share the brief moments on divorce. I've seen so many people hurt, by, and I don't want them to hurt, Lord. That there is grace, there is mercy for that, Father. Father, as we go out into the day today, let us never forget how much you love us. That you forgave us. You judged that sin on the cross. Wow. I wouldn't have done it, but I'm not God. Thank God you did that. And you loved me as a sinner before I became your child. Wow. There's nothing I can do, Lord, except to continue to love you and praise you and work out my salvation. That's my prayer for everybody. That in ways that they're walking, continue to walk your salvation walk. I don't care if you're 8 or 88 or 100. God still has a beautiful purpose for you. Father, now as we close and go to prayer, let us just continue to praise you. And let us go out and, and let that not wind down like a tank of gas through the week. Keep us in the word of God. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Father, you sent Jesus to earth at that precious time. And he lived his ministry out in your time, Lord. Help us to do the same thing in our ministry. Our ministry for you. Our ministry for the kingdom. To walk these walks in your time with you. In the good, in the bad, and even the oh so, so ugly, Lord. The times of joy and praise in the times of repentance, Lord. 
Let it not just be in the four walls and the ceiling of this church, but let it be in our hearts. Whether we give or share the love of Jesus or put an arm around somebody or say, talk to me, I'll listen. Thank you, Father, that all this happens in your time. Help us to walk with you step by step, even to the end. And we know that even when that end happened, it's a whole new beginning. It's a part of eternity. Thank you, Father. We love you, Jesus. Love you, Father. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Holy Spirit. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated.